Amen. What we have now in this portion of our service is a, a reading from God's Word. Our brother Jeff Harrington is going to come and read from 1 Samuel chapter 22. What we're doing uh, this summer, if you're new or visiting with us, is we are doing a series called Stories and Psalms. Uh, and in this series, uh, we are reading portions of Old Testament narrative and then uh, preaching a sermon from the Psalms that kind of spring forth out of that narrative. And so we have stories from the Old Testament and we see David or whatever psalmist is reflecting on that event. And our scripture reading today is from Psalm chapter, or I'm sorry, from 1 Samuel chapter 22. Uh, just to give you a little bit of context, from the last two weeks, if you've been here or listened to those sermons, uh, you'll know that, that uh, 1 Samuel 21 was, was kind of the context that those sermons uh, and those passages, those psalms were birthed out of, where David is on the run from Saul, and then he is uh, on the run into the, the town of Gath. Well, in that, we, we talked about how he goes uh, to this uh, place called Nob. He gets uh, the sword of Goliath and then goes to Gath, where Goliath is from, carrying the sword of this slain warrior. Well, there was a verse there that was foreshadowing for what we'll see today. Listen to this. This is 1 Samuel 21. This is when Ahimelech is helping David. There was this one little verse kind of buried there, 21 verse 7. Now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. His name was Doeg the Edomite, the chief of Saul's herdsmen. So in the chapter before the one that we're about to read, there was this little bit of foreshadowing about there was a guy who was there who saw Ahimelech helping David. Why is that going to be important? We'll see in our scripture reading uh, from 1 Samuel chapter 22. First Samuel 22, verses 6 through 23. Now Saul heard that David was discovered, and the men who were with him, and Saul was sitting at Gibeah under the tamarisk tree on a height with his spear in his hand, and all his servants were standing about him. And Saul said to his servants who stood about him, Hear now, people of Benjamin, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards? Will he make you all commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds, that all of you have conspired against me? No one discloses to me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. None of you is sorry for me or discloses to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as at this day. Then answered Doeg the Edomite, who stood by the servants of Saul. I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob, to Ahimelech the son of Ahitub, and he inquired of the Lord for him, and gave him provisions, and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. Then the king sent to summon Ahimelech the priest, and the son of Ahitub, and all his father's house, the priests who were at Nob, and all of them came to the king. And Saul said, Hear now, son of Ahitub. And he answered, here I am, my Lord. And Saul said to him, Why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse, in that you have given him bread and a sword and have inquired of God for him, so that he has risen against me to lie in wait as it is this day? Then Ahimelech answered the king, And who among all your servants is so faithful as David? Who is the king's son-in-law and captain over your bodyguard and honored in your house? Is today the first time that I have inquired of God for him? No. Let not the king impute anything to his servant or all the house of my father, for your servant has known nothing of all this, much or little. And the king said, You shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's house. And the king said to the guard who stood about him, Turn and kill the priest of the Lord, because their hand also is with David. And they, knew that he and they knew that he fled and did not disclose it to me. But the servants of the king would not put out their hand to strike the priest of the Lord. Then the king said to Doeg, You turn and strike the priest. And Doeg the Edomite turned and struck down the priest, and he killed on that day eighty-five persons who wore the linen ephod. And Nob, the city of priests, he put to the sword both men 
And woman, child, and infant, ox, donkey, and sheep he put to the sword. But one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. And Abiathar told David that Saul had killed the priest of the Lord. And David said to Abiathar, I knew on that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the priests of your father's house. Stay with me, do not be afraid, for he who seeks my life seeks your life. With me, you shall be in safekeeping. It was a, it's a long portion of scripture. If you weren't following what was going on there, Saul learns of David that he's been helped and that he's in hiding, and he questions all the men around him. And he says, will the son of Jesse treat you the way that I will treat you? And he wants to know why nobody has been on his side for calling out and for letting him know when there's being plots and, and things to, to help David because he wants him dead. So Doeg finally lets him know what he has seen, and Saul goes off, orders the slaughter of 85 priests who weren't going to fight back, unarmed, innocent. None of his men will step up to the plate to do that. And so he turns to Doeg, and Doeg kills all 85 of them. And he goes into the town of Nob, and he kills everybody, everything, men, women, children, animals. Let's pray. Father, we are surrounded in this world by wickedness. We see it in your word. We see it on the front page of the paper. We see it on our phones and on our devices. Lord, we know it all too well. Your word does equip us to think about such things. Your word is not sanitized and scrubbed of the sins and foibles of humanity. Your word says there's none righteous, no, not one, including all of us in this room. God, would you help us? Would you illumine your word to us? Would you aid us in receiving it and thinking well about it that you might equip us to live in this world and to long for the return of King Jesus? We pray in his name. Amen. Well, one of the oldest and thorniest issues in philosophy in general, certainly, but especially in religious philosophy, is what is known as the problem of evil. Many have wrestled with the problem of evil throughout the centuries, but the most basic philosophical reasoning is is often attributed to an ancient Greek philosopher named Epicurus. Epicurus said, if God is omniscient, meaning all-knowing, he knows all things, And if God is omnipotent, he is all-powerful, he can do anything. And if he is omnibenevolent, he is all good, does what is good, thinks what is good, knows what is good. If that God exists, that's the God that the Bible says exists, if that God exists who is all-knowing and all-powerful and all-good, then evil doesn't exist. The rationale here is that if God we're all knowing he would know about all evil as well as know how to get rid of all evil. If God were all powerful, he would have the ability, the the strength, the ability to get rid of evil. Not only would he know about it, but he would have the power to do something about it. And if he were all good, then he would want to do it. He would want to get rid of all the evil in the world. However, Epicurus says, I see evil all around me. Ergo, that God doesn't exist. Or there's a God who exists who isn't like the God that the Bible is saying exists. Because if he did exist, he would be powerful enough, he would know enough, and he would be good enough to do something about the problem of evil. Church, you know as well as I do, Epicurus was not the last person to grapple with the problem of evil. My question for us this morning is, what do you do in light of really awful stuff? What do you do in light of the really horrible things that happen in our world and happen in your own life? How do we grapple well in a fallen world where we experience evil personally and then we look out around us and we observe things that happen to others that are just plain out wicked? 
as Christians, we are not without a response. We are not without a biblical perspective on how to think well about this and how to answer the problem of evil. We need to be ready to counsel our own hearts when we observe those things and the own doubts start to creep into our minds and hearts, and we need to be equipped to answer that question for friends and family in a world that is watching the same things play out that we are, helping others to think through it well. Well, our psalm this morning, in light of the atrocity that we just read about in 1 Samuel 22, is going to be David's reflection on that, and I think Psalm 52 helps us to reflect on the problem of evil a bit further. So if you have a copy of God's Word, please make your way to Psalm chapter 52. As we look at this psalm together, what I want to argue from our text is that the steadfast love of God and uh, the steadfast love of God anchors us in an evil world. The steadfast love of God anchors us in an evil world. We're going to see this in kind of three headings as we go through Psalm 52. The steadfast love of God enables us to, to do three things or to have three things. So number one, the steadfast love of God enables us to have a proper evaluation of evil. A proper evaluation of evil, perspective on it. Number two, the steadfast love of God enables us to have an accurate anticipation regarding evil. An accurate anticipation regarding evil. And number three, the steadfast love of God that anchors us in an evil world, it enables us to have a secure protection against evil. A secure protection against evil. So a proper evaluation of evil, a proper anticipation of what will come of evil, and a secure protection of evil in this life and in the life to come. Look at Psalm 52 along with me as we turn to God's Word again. Psalm 52, to the choir master, a maskil of David, when Doeg the Edomite came and told Saul, David has come to the house of Ahimelech. Why do you boast of evil, O mighty man? The steadfast love of God endures all the day. Your tongue plots destruction like a sharp razor, you worker of deceit. You love evil more than good and lying more than speaking what is right. You love all words that devour, O deceitful tongue. But God will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous shall see and fear and shall laugh at him, saying, See the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and sought refuge in his own destruction. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. I will thank you forever because you have done it. I will wait for your name for it is good in the presence of the godly. Number one, the steadfast love of God enables us to have a proper evaluation of evil. You see there in the superscript, right before verse 1 in Psalm 52, the occasion for this psalm, right? It's the incident that we just read about in 1 Samuel 22, where Doeg rats out Ahimelech for helping David, and then when Saul gives that order, Doeg personally kills all the priests of the Lord and then turns his attention to the town of Nob and kills the men and women and children and animals in that town. There's nothing we can say about this act other than it is pure wickedness. It is pure evil. And we see that in David's response in verse 1, calling this evil out to the Lord. He says, why do you boast of evil, O mighty man? That O mighty man is meant to be sarcastic. O big tough guy. You boast of your evil, slaughtering unarmed, innocent civilians, men and women and children. O mighty man that you are. And he says, and you're boastful. You're boasting in your evil. We see here what we also see around us, that glorying in sin is a sure sign of lostness. Glorying in sin is a sure sign of 
pure and utter rebellion against the Lord. So David sees that and he calls it out, the wickedness, the evil. And then in verses 2 through 4, Doeg's wicked actions are uh, outlined with, with David focusing mainly on his speech. Look there again in verses 2 through 4. He says, his tongue plotted destruction. His tongue was like a, a razor that was cutting. You worker of deceit. He was deceitful in what he was speaking. He says, you love evil more than good, and you love lying more than speaking truth. He loves words that devour deceitful tongue, he says. I point that out because the focus on speech is interesting. Because it, Just think back to the passage that Jeff read for us a few minutes ago from 1 Samuel 22. You don't see a whole lot of speaking. Right? You don't see a whole lot of talk going on on Doeg's behalf. You see a whole lot of action. You see a whole lot of murdering. You don't see a whole lot of speaking. But if you look back to the 1 Samuel 22 story, the one place we see him speaking is in verse 9. Saul asks why no one is willing to tell him what's going on. No one is willing to help him. And Doeg speaks up and says this in 1 Samuel 22, 9. He says, I saw David, the son of Jesse, coming to Nob, to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub. And he acquired, uh, inquired of the Lord for him and gave him provisions and gave him the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. That's it. That's what he says. Which means, right there, Doeg knew exactly what he was doing. We see that from the reflection in Psalm 52. Doeg knew exactly what he was doing all along. This wasn't just an innocent information dump. Oh, you need some, you need some recon? You need some information? Oh, yeah, I saw some stuff. I'll supply it to you. No, the entire time, he wanted to wreak some havoc. The entire time, he wanted to take out these priests of the Lord. The entire time, he wanted to do this atrocity. Doeg had wicked motives from the start. Being an informant to Saul was, was his cutting with his forked razor tongue. Loving evil more than speaking what was right. Words that devour. That was it from the jump. When he started to speak, he knew exactly the effect that that would have on Saul. I mean, you've read the narrative. You don't think, well, if Saul's going to take this okay... Right? He knew exactly what would happen. He knew exactly what Saul's response was going to be. And so he dangles the carrot. He drops that little bit of information, those data points, knowing what Saul would do with it. And likely knowing that he was going to be able to be involved in the atrocity that followed. That, that was his speaking of deceit. That was his words that devour. That was his razor tongue. Let me just take a moment here to point out well, we see over and over in Scripture the powerful reminder for us of the power of the tongue and the need to control it. Because in controlling our tongues, we're really trying to control our hearts. He's speaking what's in his heart here. The same thing happens for you and for me. Restraining the tongue is hard because it's, we're not restraining the tongue, we're restraining the heart. It's true for Doeg, it's true for you, it's true for me. Might I just say this as we live in relationship with one another, beware of innocently giving information, though you know the weight that it will carry with the person that you deliver it to. I can't count the number of times there's been a squabble amongst the kids in my home, and something one of them says and sets off somebody else, and the response is, what? I was just saying. Ever hear that, parents? What? I was just saying. Yeah, I know exactly what you're saying, and you knew exactly what you're saying, and you did it anyway because you knew that's the response that it would get. A bit more sophisticated version of that for us as adults is our sharing of prayer requests about others. Maybe in your workplace, it's a well-placed comment in front of a supervisor. What? I'm, I'm just giving information, knowing the result that that's going to have on that coworker of yours and the perspective it's going to give. Friends, we all have the disease that Doeg has here. He's got it in a much larger, more devious, maybe more evil and wicked manner. But we all have the heart that overflows into the tongue and the giving of data points and mere information, knowing what that will do and the havoc that that can wreak on others. 
So David sees this evil and he calls it out. He calls it out as evil. He calls it out as wicked. He calls it out as it's wrong. It's ugly. It's grotesque. And I think that's important for us. Calling evil, evil is important for us. And I want you to remember, I want you to recall another line from 1 Samuel 22. There was a line at the end of that, 1 Samuel 22, verse 22, where David said to Biathar, he says, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of your father's house. Did you catch that when we read through? This is David. David says, as he's talking with him, Abiathar, everybody's dead. Everybody's gone. All his friends, all his, all his relations, everybody's gone. The animals are gone. He alone escapes to tell David what's going on. And as David is receiving him, one of the things that David says is, is I have occasioned the death of the persons of your father's house. David knows that it was because of him and Saul's bloodthirst against him that the context was created for this to happen. But listen, do you see that anywhere in Psalm 52? You don't see that anywhere in Psalm 52. David didn't do it. David didn't do it, but he provided the context in which evil was done. And so you read that. If you're like me, you read Psalm 20, or, uh, 1 Samuel 22, and you just wonder if David is going to be crushed under the weight of the guilt for the rest of his life. That was because of me. And as you see his turn to worship, as you see his processing it before the Lord, as you see his leading the nation of Israel and how they're going to remember this and how they're going to sing about it, you don't get a whiff of that. Why? Because David didn't do it. Doeg did it. Doeg was evil. Doeg did this. And I point that out because some of us in this room have been a part of things that are traumatic, things that are difficult, things that are painful. Whether that's by your profession and what you do for a living or just in relationship general in life, and if we're not careful, that guilt will come back. That evil happened because of me. That wrong happened because of me. It's a vital part for healing for any of us to certainly confess and repent when we have done things that are wrong. But to remember that if somebody else has chosen evil, that person has chosen evil. That person has done what was wrong. They are responsible for those actions. You just have to see in Psalm 52 that David has thought that clear in his mind. He's not crushed under the guilt of that. Horrible is that, I can't, unimaginable but he's not crushed under the guilt of that. He's given that to the Lord and he knows that he's followed the Lord and other people's evil actions are other people's evil actions. And friends, we just need to be free of that and to process in a similar way with the evil that exists around us and the pains that exist around us in this life. So David is clear. David is clear about these evil acts, but there's something else <laughs> that he is equally clear on. If you'll note what else he says in verse one. Psalm 52, verse 1, he says, Why do you boast of evil, O mighty man? The steadfast love of God endures forever. He's equally clear on that. Right? You see the contrast there. He's pointing out the evil, wicked acts, and, and he'll even continue in verses 2 through 4, but buried in there in half of verse 1 is him pointing out a contrast and making a proclamation that in contrast, Doeg, to your evil, your wickedness, everybody else who knows what happened, everybody else who saw the evil and everything that happened, in contrast to that, we have a God whose steadfast love endures all the day. That verse right there, or that line, steadfast love of God, you'll see it again if you look down at the end of our psalm. Then of our psalm, you see it again that the, I trust, verse 8, I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. So that idea of the steadfast love of God or the enduring love of God, the loyal love of God where he makes promises to his people and he doesn't turn back on them. He says, I will always be with you and he will always be with you. He says, I love you and I've proven that love for you that is always going to be shown to be true. That steadfast love of whatever else that David wants Israel and us to walk away from this psalm thinking, it's the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. He bookends his psalm with that. He starts with it. He finishes with it. He wants us walking away with that in our minds. The steadfast love of God, no matter what we see around us. David saw evil. 
He saw wickedness. He saw incredible atrocity. Right? He, he, he sees all of that. But what he wants us to reflect on and to be reminded of and to be built up in is the steadfast love of God, the loyal love of God that never fails. So I think in these first few verses, church, we are reminded here that evil is to be seen in light of God's goodness. Evil is an affront to him. Evil runs contrary to the way things were created to be. When we see evil, we must have a biblical evaluation of it, which is what David gives us right here. Because there are worldviews. There are worldviews out there and religions out there, worldviews that promote the idea that evil is co-eternal with God. Or that, that religions that see good and evil as eternally existing or equally powerful, that there's a good God and then there's an evil God, and they're always kind of duking it out against one another throughout the ages. There are theological opinions that would see God as the author of evil, that he created it. And friends, you have to see that when we have a biblical evaluation of evil, none of those things are true. None of those things are our worldview. Evil is not co-eternal with God. God is not the author of evil. We see that right here. Doeg, you are evil. By contrast, the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. So those other things are not the Christian perspective. And we see that here in Psalm 52. So David sees that evil, but then he runs straight to the idea that this is not who God is. This is not the way things were meant to be. Evil does not overshadow God's goodness. Evil does not nullify God's love. So a Christian evaluation of evil must begin with God and his character. He is good. He is loving. He created the world, and he said, it is what? It is good. Now, he also created a world with freedom of choice. Or he didn't make us all and create us all as robots. We, we, we do have some freedom of choice in this life, and we see Satan rebelling against God, wanting to make himself equal with God. We see Adam and Eve choosing disobedience and sin, and now that fall affects all of us, all of humanity, all of creation, until the return of Christ. But God is not the author of evil, nor is evil the way the things once were. There was a world that was created without evil, and there will one day be a world without evil. But we have to have a Christian evaluation of this and, and, and a proper evaluation to look at this and to know that, there, that, that, that there's a past to evil. We, we, we see it come into the storyline, and God's not the author of it, and it's not equally powerful with God, and it doesn't nullify his good, goodness or his love or his faithful, faithfulness. The steadfast love of God enables us to have a proper evaluation of evil. The second thing, and there are three stanzas here in our text. The second stanza and the second thing that we will see is that the steadfast love of God enables us to not just have a proper evaluation of evil, but also an accurate anticipation regarding evil, an accurate anticipation regarding evil. Just a little kind of Bible study tip as you've reading as you've read Psalm 52, maybe you notice this, but as you look at the, the, the pronouns that are used in the psalm, I don't know if you caught that they change. So in the, the first stanza there, the first what, four verses, it's all you, it's second person. He's talking about Doeg, he's calling out his evil, it's you, 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 you. And then in the last two verses, verses eight and nine, what do you see there? There's another pronoun shift, isn't there? It, it's, it's David's own self-reflections. I, I, it's first person. I, I, I. And in the middle, he's going to go third person. So second person ends it with first person right in the middle. Got second person. You English teachers out here, you're welcome for me kind of keeping up the, you know, continuing education over the summer for all your students. Second, uh, third person in the middle where he's looking at God's action. So the second stanza right here sandwiched in the middle of this is God's actions, third person, both how God responds to evil and then how God's people respond to that evil, how the righteous will respond. And so what we see in verse 5, Psalm chapter 52, verse 5, but God will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous shall see and fear and shall laugh at him, saying, See the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and sought refuge in his own destruction. So we see in verse 5 that God 
will deal with Doeg's wickedness. I think it's interesting there. Normally when we see but God in Scripture, you may have heard preachers point this out before. When we see but God in Scripture, it's often an encouraging, joyful thing, right? Famously in Ephesians chapter 2, talks about our being dead in our trespasses and sins. So apart from Christ, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. But God, this is Ephesians chapter 2, verse God, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved through faith. You've probably heard people say those are the two best words in the Bible. But God, we were dead in our trespasses and sin, but God made us alive together with Christ. It's not the same but God that we get here in Psalm 52, 5. All right, Psalm 52, 5, but God will break you down forever. So here we see the rampant wickedness of Doeg, but God will not let his evil go unpunished and undealt with. Listen, both of those but gods glorify him. Both of them do. The Ephesians 2, but God made you alive together with him, that glorifies God. God saying, Doeg, I will not let you get away with your wickedness forever, but I will tear you down, that glorifies God. God is glorified in his grace and his mercy, and God is glorified in his justice and his right judgment. You have to have room for both of those in your theology. Both of those things magnify God and exalt him and lift him up and glorify him. He is glorified in his saving of the sinner by grace through faith, and he is glorified in his judgment of evil and punishing of wickedness because he is a good, just judge. One displays his grace, one displays his mercy. And friend, if you're new to Christianity or to church, both of those things come together at the cross of Christ. Both of those things. That's why Jesus died on a cross. Because there was righteousness that we lacked, that we couldn't earn on our own, and there was righteousness that he alone solely possesses. We need it. We can't get it. He's got it, and he wants to impute that to us. Right? So, if for any of us to be saved, God's justice has to rightly fall on us. I've said this before, you, you've heard this before, but if, if I were to die and float up to pearly gates, this isn't how it's going to happen, but if that did happen and, you know, and I, I kind of float up there and somebody says, why should I let you in? You know the response. You shouldn't. That's the right answer. You shouldn't let me in. If you're talking about the definition of should, that means merit. If you're talking about what I deserve, I deserve judgment. (laughs) I know me. I know me better than you do. And I know that what I've thought about today, what I've said this week, could disqualify me in light of a holy, pure, loving God. And then I'm going to point. Then I'm going to point at Jesus and say, but (laughs) you said if I trust in him, I could be saved. And at the cross of Christ, God's justice fell on his son so that it wouldn't have to fall on you. The Bible says he is both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. Only in Christianity with a triune God working together for our salvation, God electing and foreknowing and calling us and Christ shedding his blood to redeem us and the Holy Spirit sealing us for the day of redemption, only in that do you have a salvation. Because God has to be just. He has to punish evil. And he has to save people. Only way to do that is by his innocent son, Christ, dying on the cross in our place, taking our punishment as our substitute, and then defeating death that we all might live. He is both just and justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. So when you see the but God here in verse 5, and you see the but God in Ephesians chapter 2, you look at both of those and you say, praise God. Praise God for his mercy. Praise God for his justice. And so in verse 5, we see pictured, uh, justice pictured with an increasing intensity, if you note there, right? God will break you down forever. He will snatch you up and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. So that that first image is is an image of a heap of ruins broken down. And then God, in the second image, he is even removing that rubble from the home. You're you're even, the rubble's even homeless. He's going to tear you from your tent and carry you off. And then switching to an agricultural metaphor for the third line, he would just root you out and tear you from the land of the living, completely removed. Doeg is going to get what's coming to him if he doesn't repent and turn. 
The righteous, those who are followers of God, you see that there in the text, are meant to take this as a comfort that God will deal with evil. God will act. And we're meant to take it as a sober warning to do what is good and not what is evil. So this is a message to all, to folks like Doeg and to anybody who's watching, that your evil will get you nowhere. God will deal with it. Rebellion against Jesus will get you nowhere. It will get you to hell. The only way to escape that is by turning and trusting in Christ. He will deal with all evil. And so this is why verses 6 and 7 describe the response of the righteous to, to God's response. God's people will see and will be reminded of what happens when you trust in yourself instead of trusting in the Lord. It's a reminder of what happens when God isn't our refuge, but our own stuff, our money, our jobs, our family, our faith, our, or the faith of a family member, our religious devotion. When any of those things are our refuge, instead of Christ being our refuge, this is what happens. The path is destruction. It's like seeking refuge in your own destruction. Oh, I'm good. I've got it. I've got a nice job. Oh, I'm good. I've got it. I've got a lot of money. Oh, I'm good. I've got it. My wife's a Christian. Oh, I'm good. I got it. My grandparents took me to church way back in the day. Oh, I'm good. I got it. I prayed a prayer when I was five. Trusting in your own destruction. If it's anything other than a current abiding trust in Christ that's bearing spiritual fruit in your life. Friends, and you're grappling with the problem of evil, you have to look at the big picture. We have the same reflection about evil in our world and the same anticipation of what God will do with it that David does. Because God will deal with evil. So one of the reasons that Christianity has an answer to the problem of evil is that we know the past, the present, and the future of it. And we know the past, the present, and the future of it. This has been a helpful paradigm for me as I've uh, talked about this with others and grappled with it in my own life. So we know the past of evil. I've already talked about that. It's not co-eternal with God. He's not the author of it. We know the, presence of, uh, the present of evil, right? We experience it now, still under his sovereign care. And we experience that evil now and are called to endure until he returns. But we also know, which I think this point is getting at, the future of it. He will deal with evil. He will destroy and condemn the wicked and the those who finally and fully rebel against him. So listen, the question isn't, why won't God get rid of evil? So if you're in a conversation and you're thinking about it on your own, that's not the question. So if God's so good, why won't God get rid of evil? The answer is he will. He's promised that. God will get rid of evil. The question is, why hasn't he done it yet? Why hasn't he done it yet? Well, first, I, I do think that God is restraining evil in this world. If God weren't restraining evil in some measure, things would be way, as bad as they are, they would be way worse than what they are. Things could be much worse. And I do think that God judges evil even now in the sense that there's consequences here and now for our actions and consequences here and now in this life for our disobedience. Right, so I think all of that's true. But another thing that we know from Scripture is that God is patiently waiting. So not, why won't God get rid of evil? He will. Why hasn't he done it yet? The Bible said he's wait, patiently waiting for you to be saved. <laughs> he's patiently waiting and saving a people to himself. The Apostle Peter talks about people in latter times who are going to scoff at Christians. Oh, you Christians talk about how Jesus is going to come back. Well, where is he? He ain't come back yet. Peter says this, 1 Peter 3, 8. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Verse 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness. Question isn't why hasn't God done anything but evil, it's why hasn't he done it yet. Peter says, his timeline's not our timeline. God's not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness but he's patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Why hasn't God judged evil yet? Because we can't pick and choose what evil we want him to get rid of. I got saved in 1999. I'm personally very, very grateful God didn't rid the world of evil in 1998. 
There may be some of you sitting in this room that I hope would say that in 2024. Man, I'm glad God didn't rid the world of evil in 2023 because you're not covered by the blood of Christ. We can't pick, where are we going to draw the line? We want God to rid the world of evil. What evil? Just the really big stuff done by the really big sinners? Or all the evil? The stuff that you and I do when we lie and when we cheat and when we steal and when we lust and when we're prideful and when we have our own idols? You can't have it both ways. God's either going to rid the world of all of it, which he will, or allow us to continue to endure in this world in which we have that as he continues to save people. Romans 3.23, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Ecclesiastes 7.20, surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. 1 John 1, 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And so when we say, God, get rid of evil, we've got to draw the line. We know that he's going to get rid of evil. He just hasn't done it yet. We can't pick and choose what we want him to get rid of. He will rid the world of evil, and each day that goes by in which he hasn't completely rid the world of evil by his son, you'll know it. You're going to be a trumpet. <laughs> Jesus is going to return. He's going to come for his people. He's going to He's going to uh, receive all those who have trusted in him and judge those who have not. Each day that goes by is another day that he's patiently waited so that the gospel could go forth to more people. Maybe that's what's happening right here this morning. But the day will come, and very, I didn't read it, but the very next verse in 1 Peter says the day will come like a thief. You don't know a thief's coming, and he's probably better armed than you are. The day will come like a thief. Be ready so you don't have to get ready. Psalm 52, verses 5 and 7, 5 through 7, remind us that God will deal deal with evil and that we are to be warned to put our refuge in Him and not in ourselves. The steadfast love of God enables us to have an accurate anticipation regarding evil. It's part of how we're anchored against the problem of evil in this world. Finally, the steadfast love of God enables us to have a secure protection against evil. So we have a right evaluation of evil, we have a right anticipation regarding evil, and then we have a secure protection against evil. Look at the last stanza there where David turns kind of introspective and looks at himself, but I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. I will thank you forever because you have done it. I will wait for your name for it is good in the presence of the godly. So in this final stanza, we see David look at himself, right? So he's looked at Doeg in the first stanza and called him out for evil before the Lord, and then he's looked at God in the second stanza and his response, and now he gives this personal perspective. As an individual caught up in all of this, as a person trying to be faithful, observing all the wickedness in our fallen world, what can be said? Well, here we have another contrast in verse 8. It starts with the word but. In contrast to the wicked who will be uprooted, David knows that he is like a green olive tree in the house of God. The olive tree is one of the longest living trees. It's a picture of stability. It's a picture of longevity. And the presence of olive trees represented provision and blessing as well. Actually, one of Israel's prophets after this, uh, a prophet named Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 11, is going to say this of Israel. He says, The Lord once called you a green olive tree, beautiful with good fruit. So that's the image of a green olive tree, beautiful and with good fruit. So David is considering himself a green olive tree, and in doing so, he's uh, giving a picture of health and stability, of beauty and fruitfulness. Contrary to being uprooted, he is thriving, he is fruitful, he is safe. Now, if you've been tracking the narrative so far, you're like, how can you say that? You're hiding in a cave, and you're on the run, and you're acting like a crazy person drilling on yourself. I mean, it's just, his, his life is insane. But he knows that in the Lord, he has a secure protection. He's solid on that fact. He's planted in the house of God, not snatched and torn from his home, as was said of Doeg in verse 5, but planted in the house of God, safe, secure, blessed. So that's what he's like, and then the remaining lines reveal what he will do. 
his actions. He says, it says he will trust, he will thank, and he will wait. Those are the three things you see there in uh, verse eight, second half of verse eight, and then in verse nine. I will trust, I will thank, I will wait. So in a fallen world, as we await the return of Christ and see evil and wickedness around us, I'd encourage those same three actions for you. Trust, thank, and wait. Trust. He says, I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. Again, hopefully you've gotten this by now throughout this sermon that we have a perspective on evil in this world that includes the past, present, and future of it. Right? The past, it's not the way it's supposed to be. Shout out there, there's a great book uh, by Cornelius Plantiga called Not the Way It's Supposed to Be. It's a book about sin. Phenomenal if you want to reflect on the nature of sin. So the past, not the way it's supposed to be. The future, it will be dealt with. Not a question of if, but when and why. He's saving people. And then the present, how do we live now? And the Christian is called to trust in God's steadfast, loyal love. How long? Forever and ever. That's the timeline on our security. (laughs) We trust in his steadfast love forever and forever, secure in his hands. You know, we have an even clearer picture of God's love than what David did because God put his love on display ultimately and fully at the cross of Christ. Greater love has no one than this, that they lay down their life for their friends. God demonstrated his love for us and that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. So so we have a display at this side of the cross, this side of the cross in the empty tomb of what love really looks like in a way that David only took by faith. And with this greater picture, listen to this from a New Testament perspective. I think this is a, a great New Testament flavor of Psalm 52. It's John chapter 15. So David, who says, I'm a green olive tree in the house of the Lord. I'm safe and I'm secure. I'm fruitful. Listen to John 15. Jesus says this. He says, I am the vine. So you want an agricultural metaphor like the green olive tree. Jesus says, I am the vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. Sounds like Doeg, doesn't it? Removed, snatched, torn up. He is thrown away and withers and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I love, have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, what does it look like, abide in my love? He says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Friends, if you want the experience of David, not the experience of Doeg, that's what we must do. Abide in Jesus. Abide in him. Keep his commandments. Read his commandments. Know his word. Live them. Obey the Lord. You can't force yourself to feel something, but you can obey. Stay near to him. Give yourself to telling others about that love and evangelism. It's one of the ways that we are built up and are trusting him is by constantly telling other people about that and rehearsing the message of the goodness of the gospel. If we just avoid ever talking about that, we're not reminding ourselves of it as we're reminding others of it. An evangelistic life is a life that's trusting the Lord and going to be constantly built up in that. A life that is given to discipleship, not just telling people about Jesus who maybe don't know him, but then around other Christians, of making sure we're intentional to build each other up in that same faith. That's what it looks like to obey him and to keep his commandments and abide in him and remind ourselves of his goodness, to actively trust in him. It reinforces our trust and allows us to abide in him all the more. So trust. Thank. He says there, I will thank you forever because you have done it. 
We spent a, a good bit of time on this last week. I won't rehash everything that we talked about there, but he thanks God because when God is for you, it's as good as done. Last week, we looked briefly at Philippians chapter 4, where it talks about our anxiety, and we take our anxiety to God, right? Prayers and supplications with thanksgiving and the peace of God, which surpasses all understandings, will, will be given to you. We, we take our anxiety and our worries and our issues and our troubles, we take them to God, Paul says, with thanksgiving. It's not even over yet. It's not even solved yet. But we do it because we know he's good. And that's the same thing that we saw in our psalm last week. It's the same thing we see here. It's the same thing we see throughout the Bible. With God, we can go ahead and thank him. <laughs> we can go ahead and thank him, though we're still waiting. We can go ahead and thank him, though the pain is still there. We can go ahead and thank him, though the anxieties and the worries are still around us, the stress is still there. We can go ahead and thank him. Even if we don't know the specifics of what he'll do, we know he's going to do it. <laughs> Even if evil is done, like Joe, you look back to the story of Joseph, just incredible evil, people trying to, his own brother's trying to kill him and sell him into slavery. And he says what they meant for evil, God meant for good. We see that all things work together for the good of those who love God and those who are called according to his purposes. Romans. We know that we can trust him. Even a preemptive thanking God for what he will do, even if we don't know the specifics of quite what he'll do, when we do that, it tunes our hearts to search out and to cherish his will above our own. Not my will, but yours, God. Thank you for how you're going to answer this, even if it's not what I want, because I want what you want. That's how Jesus prayed. That's how we pray. It cultivates trust and contentment in our hearts as well. Listen, David surely struggled with doubts. David surely struggled with questions. He, he lays them all bare in the book of Psalms. But he doesn't wallow there. He trusts. He thanks the Lord. And then wait. Trust, thank, and wait. He says, I will wait for your name, for it is good in the presence of the godly. He's going to wait in a community of people in the presence of the godly. Indeed, he's writing this psalm, and he's not singing it as a solo. He's singing it in a community of other, uh, of, of other Israelites. He's going to sing the psalm together with others. He's going to be in the presence of the godly, and he says, I will wait for your name in the presence of the godly because his name is good. He will wait for God to act and to reveal fully his nature and character and the actions that he takes for his own glory and for the good of those who loved him and or love him and are called according to his purposes. He will wait for God to vindicate his name by uplifting and exalting those who trust in him and by executing justice on those who have spurned and cursed his name. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 says this, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Therefore, preparing your minds for action, how do we deal with the problem of evil? How do we grapple with all this wickedness around us? Well, we trust him, we thank him, and we wait for him. We wait on him. It's, a, it's an act of trusting, wait. Prepare your minds for action, being sober-minded thinking rightly, clearly, accurately, set your hope fully on the grace of God that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Church, this is what you must do in a world where evil abounds. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be yours in full measure at the second coming of Christ. He's coming quickly. The steadfast love of God enables us to have a secure protection against evil. Let's conclude with a final summarizing observation. One more observation here. Remember 1 Samuel 22? There was a line there. It was right after the line where David said, hey, I've, I've occasioned this. Right? I provided the context for all this wickedness to happen. What did he say right after that? Verse 23 of 1 Samuel 22. He says to Abiathar, he says, stay with me. Do not be afraid. For he who seeks my life seeks your life, and with me you shall be in safekeeping. Because David's so tough, David's so strong, because his army is so fearless. <laughs> it's 
It's because he knows the steadfast love of God. We don't know for certain when this psalm was written, when it was sung, who do you think may have been standing right by David's side? Abiathar. He who saw every living person he knows slaughtered. Unimaginable wickedness and evil. Standing right beside David because David says, you stick with me. The people who want to kill you also want to kill me. And God's got me. God's made a promise to me. And that God is on our side. So as he's singing this psalm, there's a chance that Abiathar is right there with him. In the midst of David, in the midst of his own trial, when it's easy to focus on self and your own circumstances, it's good to look out and see others who are hurting and in need of, and, uh, of, need of, of processing that as well. And so he invites him to stay with him, and he tells him. He tells Abiathar. He tells himself. He tells the entire community who are around him, and he tells each and every one of us. God's people who would sing and read this psalm for generations to come, do not be afraid. Why? Because we have a God who is loyal and steadfast in his love. And there's a God who enables us to have a proper evaluation of evil, proper anticipation of what's going to happen to it, and a proper protection as we endure in this life, a secure protection against evil. There's a God we can thank and trust and eagerly wait on. Friends, Jesus will return. Evil will be done away with. The evil out there and the evil in here. No more tears, no more sinning, no more temptations. And we will sing to him forever and ever. We have a promise. Jesus says right here in this table, the blood represented in the cup, the body slain represented in the bread. Jesus said, eat and drink this and remember me until we do it together one day. He's coming back. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do pray for your help. We pray for your help in this evil world. And when we say that, even in saying this evil world, not trying to set up a, a them versus us or a out there versus in here, God, we all know that we're sinners. God, we all know that we struggle. Each and every one of us. That's why we're here. That's why we turn to Christ. That's why we look to him. God, would you help us trust you in the midst of this world? Would you help us to fight against the evil in our own hearts, and our own lives? And to anchor us in your steadfast love. And to help anchor each other there as well. We ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.